We're here today to talk about the sexiest topic in all of real estate, yeah. electrical systems. I know it's not as much fun to talk about as kitchen remodeling, your, your bathroom renovations, but it is, however, one of the most important parts of your house. And when it comes up, it's a problem. If there, if there are issues, there are emergencies. I'm Brian Gangwer from the Gangwer Real Estate Team, and I can tell you that last year, almost a third of our transactions had some sort of an electrical issue come up in an inspection. And that's not the time that you want to start to learn about what these different terms and, and some of the different uh, issues actually are and what they mean to you. Same deal goes when you're, when you're trying to sell your house. If there's a problem, you want to know about it before you put it up for sale, not after you've got everything under contract and you're in a time crunch and now you need quotes for things that you didn't even know were problems. We're here with the best electrician that I know, Jeff Black from All Pro Electrical Systems. Jeff, tell me a little bit about yourself and about the company. Hello, I'm Jeff Black. I'm the owner of All Pro Electrical Contractors. I have been an electrician for almost 30 years. I started out uh, just as a journeyman, worked my way up through the ranks with Tri-City Electric, and uh, after 20 years with them, decided I could go out on my own, pursue my electrical, state-certified electrical contractor's license, and I'm working with my two sons right now to uh, develop a business. Fantastic. Yeah. That must be a, a lot of fun working with family, I bet. Uh, it can be challenging at times, but uh, yes, for the most part, I, I enjoy know. seeing my boys learn something. So. We'll start with one of the things that is pretty common knowledge in my industry. I'm sure, in yours too, obviously. Um, Fed Pacific electrical panels. It's one of those things that it's common knowledge that there's a problem with them. It's common knowledge that they've been recalled, I believe, was the term that we've heard thrown around a lot. Um, what exactly is the problem with these specific brands of, of electrical panels? With that particular brand, they uh, have the reputation of not tripping. A breaker is designed to trip out or disconnect power if there is a short circuit or an overload on it. These particular panels uh, would not trip the way they're supposed to trip, so over time uh, it would develop enough heat that they had potential fire hazards and they have had fires can, that have uh, pertained to these panels here. So it's not required as of yet to replace them, but it is highly recommended that you do replace it before anything like that would okay. happen. So. so a higher than, than normal failure rate is what it sounds like. They just weren't really pretty much, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, I don't, I think they had a UL listing. I'm not 100% sure on that, but apparently it didn't pass a lot of the UL uh, tests that it should have, so. I don't, they're not in business anymore. Uh, I'm not sure if they even make product uh, to replace some of the stuff that okay. they have out there. So. I know uh, we deal with people who are selling their house all the time who've got this kind of an electrical panel uh -huh. and they don't even know because right. they got their insurance from this property for this house so long ago right. when they didn't even know there was an issue and they get to the point where they get this inspection report back from the person who's buying their house and they say, you need to replace this electrical panel. And they say, why? You know, there's, it's worked this whole time. I've never had a problem with it. I have insurance, but I do know from our experience with some of the insurance companies that there are companies that won't even touch a house that has this kind of a panel. Correct. So the easiest way for somebody to identify if they have one of these, is it just something on the panel that they can look at and quickly identify? Most of them are labeled. They do have their manufacturer name on it, Federal Pacific. Uh, a lot of the Federal Pacific breakers have a red coloring on the top of the breaker to kind of identify it as a Federal Pacific one. Short of that, you'd have to call in a qualified uh, certified electrician to kind of make sure that that's what you have. Okay. But uh, if, most of them should be labeled with the manufacturer's name on it and it should be right there on the yeah. uh, front cover. We've so. seen some that say F. That is true, that yes. Too. They are, uh, they do use the initials just like KF and all that. Uh, <laughs> FBE is uh, their way of if you see that, then yes, you should be calling an electrician to probably get that taken care of. Okay. So I know from our experience previously with, with some properties that had um, different brands that still had some sort of a problem, and we were told from an inspector that there was some correlation between the two. That uh, I believe it was Sylvania that, I, that bought out some of the inventory from Fed Pacific. And is there, are there any other brands that people need to look for there too? There is a brand called Zinsco. Zinsco. Z-I-N-S-C-O. And uh, 
you can identify them pretty easily because all their breakers are colored per the size of the breaker. So a 15 amp breaker might be blue, 20 amp breaker would have a red handle on it, all that. The Zinsco, uh, apparently from what I understand with them, is the bus bar is uh, not uh, what it should be and the breakers actually fuse themselves to the bus bar and once that happens they will not be able to trip. So that is the problem with the Zinsco breaker there. A little bit different than the Federal Pacific, but kind of along the same lines. Okay. So. Well, when it comes to panels, I guess one other thing that, that does seem to come up sometimes, we sell a home in downtown Orlando or historic areas of Sanford, and they've got a panel that's 80 years old. Mm -hmm. And they haven't had any issues with that panel, but we're still seeing some inspectors who are saying, it's old, you should just replace it. Is that, is, is that the case? Is there like an age limit where we can tell if it's this old, it can't handle current loads that people put on it, or is that kind of a fallacy? I don't know that it's necessarily a matter of it not being able to handle the load. Everything has a life to it, so it's just that a newer product's going to be more sensitive, more responsive to any kind of a short circuit or overload, whereas the older breaker might be too old to kind of detect that. So it's going to take a little bit longer for a little bit more overload and heat to to pick up that and trip itself out. If that's the case, then it's going to develop a lot more heat than a newer breaker would, which would cause problems eventually. So it's just recommended that you replace them because, like I say, everything has a life to it and it's just a matter of time before things are going to start going bad. So if you can uh, keep up to date with it, that'd be the great idea. Okay, another thing that we, we see not as often as the Fed Pacific panels, but something that does come up from time to time is aluminum wiring. Okay. Now, it's a little bit more common knowledge in the general public that aluminum wiring is a problem, uh -huh. but not so much why. Why is it a problem? Well, it, the problem with aluminum wiring consists in the connection or termination of it. Uh, when you connect aluminum wiring, it is a soft metal and it has a tendency to expand and contract. So when you tighten that wire down to a lug, it might seem tight at the time, but if you were to go back at a later date, it could have loosened up because of the contraction going on with that. Anytime you have a loose connection, that's where you have problems. With the copper wiring, uh, you don't usually get that. It's more durable. When you tighten it up, it stays where it's supposed to be, and it's just a better conductor all around. It's a little bit more money, that's why aluminum was used, from what I understand. It was during the Vietnam War when copper was being used for war efforts and it wasn't as plentiful as the aluminum was. So the contractors decided, well, let's just use the aluminum, it's a little less money, we've got more of it, let's try it out. They did for a number of years there, they found out they were getting some problems with it, so they shied away from it, went back to the copper conductors, and that's what we've been using ever since. So. So the easiest way to identify that is really from the color of the wires, I would assume? The easiest way would either open up a switch or receptacle to look at the conductors within the outlet box or open up a panel and you can look at the conductors coming in that are terminating in the panel to the breakers there. You'll see exposed aluminum in there. Aluminum wiring is only a concern with branch circuits when you have single conductors. You will have aluminum wiring in your house for main feeder wires. When you get into a stranded aluminum, that is an acceptable conductor. It's when it's a single conductor that that's when you have an issue with okay, it. Let me stop you there because I, I think I understand what you mean, but a lot of people might not. Yeah, when we say stranded <laughs> aluminum, you're talking about like the, the line that runs to your, your oven. To example. your oven or from your outside meter to your inside panel. Okay. It's going to be a real heavy gauged wire, real thick. But the other Media stuff wire. when it's running through the whole house is when there's... It, correct. There's the smaller wire that's feeding power to your outlets, your switches, your lights. It's only going to be kind of a single conductor, which means it's just going to have a hot wire that's an insulated wire, but it's going to be aluminum, but it's not going to have multiple strands grouped together to make a nice big piece of cable there for you. So if it's a single conductor, that's where a lot of the issues come into play. When you have a stranded conductor aluminum, that's considered a decent conductor. Nobody has any problems with that. So you find out you've got this aluminum wiring, whether by your own exploration or unfortunately most common in an inspection when you're planning to sell your house. Mm -hmm. What are your options? You have uh, 
you have a couple of options, one of which is to rewire the house, which can be a pretty expensive ordeal. It's very invasive. We do have to cut holes to get the wire installed to the different locations and all. So you are making holes in a wall, which means they have to be patched. Ultimately, though, it is the best solution uh, because you are getting back to copper and getting away from the aluminum there. The next best would be to use what they call Illumicons, which are a specific connector designed to work with aluminum and copper wiring. You cannot take aluminum and copper wiring and just put them together under a wire nut. Two dissimilar metals will start reacting against each other and will start corroding each other. And when that happens, then you get separation, you get loose connection, that's when you get fires. Because loose connection always causes fires. So. These Illumicons are designed to keep the aluminum and the copper separate under different terminals within the lug there, but still allow continuity to go through there. So that is a less expensive alternative than the rewire of the whole house. A lot of insurance companies, though, might not accept that. You would have to do some research and make sure your insurance carrier is acceptant of that and uh, that they will cover That's you good. with that installation. That's a good point. When it comes to rewiring, uh, it's my understanding that the process here in Florida is a little different than it is in other states. We've got people who relocate from, from the Northeast where they've got all the wiring run under the house. Okay. Is it easier or is it harder here in Florida with most of it run through the attics? Uh, well, that's just it. It's, it's either you go up through the attic or you go down through the basement. Up north, you have the availability of a basement, so you can run a lot of the wiring underneath the floors through the basement system and just stub them up. We don't have that availability down here. Water table's so high, we can't really dig a deep hole without right. getting water. So basements are not something that we have a lot of down here. So the only, what they call dead space that we have is the attic space. And we can thread our wires throughout the attic space and run them down the walls without anybody seeing them and anything exposed that way. So, yes, if we could go underneath the house, we would, but it just, not for the cost of the job, it just doesn't make sense to do that, you'd be better off just to run it up high and come down as opposed to running down and coming up. Now, the most common thing that we see in inspections related to electrical mm -hmm. is probably the simplest, least expensive, and one of the, the things that we, we kind of giggle about it sometimes when we hear a buyer say, oh my God, there's no GFCIs. GFIs, yep. GFCIs. <laughs> but to us, we, we know they are, and we're like, go to Home Depot. Yeah. You know, take care of this. It's not a big deal. but what we see sometimes is this misunderstanding of what they are, what they do, and why they're not there. People don't seem to understand that in some of the older code, they weren't required. Um, talk to me about GFCIs. What, what do they do? A GFCI is a ground fault circuit interrupter. They are designed to trip out if you come into contact with water or moisture. It senses that little bit of difference in potential there, and it trips itself out. You will find GFIs mainly in kitchen areas, bathroom areas, garages, porches, and exterior locations. Anywhere that you're going to be around water. Right. Okay? A lot of these locations, uh, maybe in the bathroom, outside, you might see just a regular duplex outlet. That does not mean that it's not GFI protected. Hmm. With a GFI receptacle device, it has what they call a line and a load. So if you can identify your line coming in, you'll hook those to the two terminals there, hook the load going out to the load side of that, and everything down the line from that GFI will be protected from that GFI. Okay. A lot of times you'll come into an area that it's not daisy-chained where you're going from garage to outside to bathroom. It's part of this room. So say you go into a bathroom, the outlet is part of the lighting circuit. What I have to do there is I have to change out the receptacle and just put in a GFI receptacle in that location and hook it up to the line side only, okay, so that the load would not be part of that. Still gives you the protection you need. It's only going to protect that one outlet, though. The reason that we don't do that in every location is those GFIs are pretty expensive. They can run $25 to $30 a piece, and if you had to do that in every location, it would add up quickly whereas you could put one in one location that would cover maybe six or eight outlets down the line there. You don't have to put those GFIs in every location that way. 
That's what you're referring to by daisy chains that you've kind of got others down correct, that same yeah. progression. And that's a good indication where uh, when you've got some outlets that suddenly aren't working and you can't figure out what's going on correct. with those outlets, you've probably got a GFI yeah. somewhere up the chain that you need to go back. Take a minute, think about where you're at. If you're in one of those locations that's near water, it might be affiliated with the GFI. Okay. If it's not, you should call, call a qualified electrician to come out there and take a look I think that's at always good sure advice. Call a qualified electrician. <laughs> Make sure you have that GFI protection. Okay, so one other thing that we come across, not as often, occasionally, older homes that only have two prong outlets. And we've seen uh, on some homes that we've sold, people who have made some subpar DIY attempts <laughs> at, at fixing this, where they've just gone and taken a three prong outlet and wired the two wires to the three prong outlet. First, let me ask, what is that third prong for? And then let's ask, what is the appropriate way to handle that situation? Sure. Uh, the third prong is a grounding prong. And uh, pretty much all your appliances now have three prong plugins. So the reason that you see that is that it's with the two prong, it's not as accommodating with all the appliances. So the homeowner changes them three prong so he can plug in whatever he needs to where he needs to. The problem is, is that you're putting a three prong in there that should have a ground to it. You do not have a ground in that outlet there or within that wiring. The code states that you can put a GFI device in that location that will satisfy, that will allow you to use a three prong receptacle that way. You can either use it in that location. You can find the start of the circuit and put a GFI there then everything down the line would be protected or you put a breaker in if the panel will allow a GFI breaker. Federal Pacifics don't make GFIs or any of that, so the panel has to be accommodating to it there. It is not, it is accepted by the code, but a GFI works with the ground, which you do not have. So it is not recommended to plug anything that is highly sensitive into these outlets because they do not have that grounding means within them. What is that ground wire for? It is used as an extra conductor for any fault current there. So if you have a short circuit on there, it will go to the ground wire as opposed to going to the neutral wire. The neutral wire is a current carrying conductor. A lot of people don't understand that. They think that the black wire is the only one that's carrying power. It is a circuit, it is a ring. The white wire is carrying power on there to allow everything to work correctly there. So if you disconnect that black wire and something else down line has power, that neutral wire could have power on it because it is carrying the unused portion of that circuit back to the panel. There. Okay. So I'm not trying to get too into <laughs> electricity here, but uh, yes, that's the reason for it there. So. One last thing I want to ask about. We sell a fair amount of property in Seminole County. We get up into historic Sanford. Sure. We do see this also in downtown Orlando mm -hmm. from time to time as well where we hear the term knob and tube. Yeah. It sounds funny. Yeah. What the heck is it? It was, from what I understand, it was back in the late 1800s to early 1900s, and it was a way of installing electrical systems in homes that was less expensive than using uh, an alternative means, which would be kind of like a BX cable, which is wiring within a metal sleeve kind of thing. So the knob and tube was an exposed way of running circuitry through the house there. And what they would do is exactly the way it sounds. They had little knobs going along the circuit path, which wires would tie off to. And then within between each knob, you would have a conductor that was encased in a plastic sleeve, a tube. And that would run throughout your house just as a hot and a neutral kind of conductor there. Everything was kind of exposed that way. It's some people are still using the knob and tube this, this day and age. Uh, as long as it's maintained and taken care of properly, you're okay with it. It's, you can't put insulation around it. You can't go up and beat on it or anything like that. It's a pretty delicate system there. Okay. So, yeah. so it sounds like something you can endure, but it's got it, some It would be highly advisable to find an alternative means if you could, yes. Uh, unless yeah. you're just diehard trying to keep it as historic as possible there. No, it's not something that's going to impress a lot of electricians, that's for sure. <laughs> Outside of its historic you. nature, exactly. I'm sure. They're probably going to tell you to get rid of it, if anything. But, well, yeah. Jeff, this has been fantastically informative. I really appreciate it. This yeah. is going to help a lot of our clients that are getting ready to sell their homes. It will help a lot of people who are looking to buy so that they don't 
come into this kind of a conversation when they've got 24 hours to figure out what to do. Sure. We highly encourage anybody who has electrical issues to reach out to Jeff at All Pro. We've used them at our own home. We highly recommend them to all of our clients. Thanks for watching and uh, keep an eye out for the next in our series on our home service providers.